All right, welcome back everyone. I hope you're having an amazing time so far. Our next panel is titled The State of AI in Government, The National Strategy. Please join me in welcoming our panelists to the virtual stage. Welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. We're so excited to have everyone here to talk about this very important topic. So first, I would love to go around the virtual room and get a couple of introductions from everyone. So uh, Jerry, let's kick it off with you. Hi everyone. My name is Jerry Ma and I am the Director of Emerging Technology at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Our mission is to uh, issue patents and register trademarks in promotion of domestic and international commerce. And we are, as part of that mission, heavily leveraging artificial intelligence to help our employees and our customers uh, fulfill that role. Awesome. Thanks, Jerry. Nick, let's hear from you. Hey, thanks, Patrika, and uh, hello to everyone watching. Um, really honored to be on this, uh, this panel today. My name is Nick Reese, and I'm the Deputy Director of, for Emerging Technology Policy at the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, my office covers uh, cyber infrastructure, risk and resilience uh, matters for the department and for the homeland as a whole. And uh, specifically, I work on uh, artificial intelligence, uh, quantum computing, and some other related things, um, and had a lot to do with uh, the DHS AI strategy and the executive order on AI principles. So really looking forward to this conversation. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Nick. All right, Charlie, up next. Uh, hey everybody, I'm Charlie Greenbacker. I lead the federal business for Snorkel AI. Uh, Snorkel AI is a Palo Alto based uh, startup spun out of the Stanford AI lab in 2019. Uh, our software platform enables non-technical subject matter experts to programmatically label massive amounts of machine learning training data in a matter of hours uh, without requiring armies of outsourced lab uh, labelers spending uh, months painstakingly labeling data by hand. Uh, it also helps uh, data scientists and engineers to rapidly train, analyze, and adapt uh, AI applications to changing inputs and objectives. Uh, the result is a, more, a far more scalable, secure, iterative, and auditable approach to AI application development, uh, up to 45 times faster than traditional approaches in commercial case studies uh, with the same or better accuracy in the models. Uh, Snorkel's technology is currently uh, being used by leading AI organizations like Google, Apple, and Intel Corporation, uh, as well as large enterprise customers across various industries and the federal government. Wow, thank you. That was amazing. <laughs> All right, next up is Bill. Hi, my name is Bill Menarchy, and I lead the government vertical at Samba Nova Systems, and we are a next generation AI ML compute platform. And I am honored to be here on this panel with these esteemed guests. Awesome, very exciting. Thank you, Bill. And last but not least, Torsten. Hi, Patricia. Hi, everyone. It's a great uh, honor to be a part of this panel. Uh, and greetings from uh, Berlin, Germany. I'm a, a senior fellow and director of Tache Institute. It's a public policy think tank. I'm focusing on AI governance issues uh, and uh, uh, working and participating on a multilateral level. Uh, most recently, uh, submitted a, uh, a policy brief to the G20 on uh, establishing a uh, a AI coordinating committee for the governance of AI. Uh, this year, the G20 in Italy, uh, we submitted a, also a policy brief uh, on uh, implementing a federated digital platforms to increase data sharing across various uh, industries, including the public services. And I'm uh, very excited to contribute uh, to today's discussion. Oh, thank you. Yes, we're excited. This is an, an this is an amazing group. So I'm very excited to hear these thoughts. Um, and just for the audience, I'm Patrika. I'll be moderating as a part of the AI4 team. So with that, let's get into our first question. So let me just put this up on the screen. The first question is, some say that the government is slow to adopt new technologies when compared to the private sector. And yet government organizations have also been responsible for amazing innovations over the years, such as the early internet. What is the sentiment around AI and government today? So I'm actually gonna to toss this one to Torsten first. What do you think? Well, I think uh, recently there was an article uh, by the FT uh, saying that we're experiencing a renaissance of industrial policy. 
uh, that means uh, some kind of government intervention into the market, uh, which uh, relates, of course, to the very urgent topic of uh, climate change, but also digitalization. So we see uh, 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 across the major regions uh, uh, significant investments and budget allocation uh, uh, related to AI and digitalization concerning governance, uh, guidance, regulation, uh, enabling, incentivizing the adoption uh, and the research into AI, uh, but of course also financial uh, su uh, support uh, across uh, various sectors and industries. Uh, on the other hand, the public sector, I think, has been plagued by uh, a very slow uptake of uh, digital technologies. And so there is this uh, BCG Digital Excelization Index study, uh, which always ranks uh, public service uh, digitalization lowest compared to any other industry. So uh, considering that, we have, I think, a mixed feeling. So we can see a lot of momentum, uh, a lot of activities going on uh, for the good of AI, for the good use of AI uh, within the public sector, but also how the public sector tries to enable the industries in both ways. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we, uh, we, 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 we are realistic and know that a certain uptake within the public sector has been quite slow uh, over the past years and decades. Very interesting. And how, uh, let's see from the rest of the group, agree, disagree, how are we feeling? Well, I would say it's it's different in different pockets and different parts of the government, right? There, it, it, there's uh, it's hard to talk about anything in terms of the public public sector is one thing, and just like different companies are doing different things, different different governments, different government agencies do different things. So uh, uh, at Snorkel, our our kind of journey started, like I mentioned, back at the Stanford AI Lab. Uh, um, the original research behind Snorkel's technology was funded by over 20 U.S. government research grants from uh, DARPA, ONR, uh, Department of Energy, NIH, NSF, and, and others. Uh, and it continues today with you know, the, the many US government customers that we're proud to, to support. Uh, I think that the sentiment overall that we're seeing in governments around AI is um, certainly positive and growing, uh, but it's also maturing as organizations better understand what it, what it really takes to operationalize this technology, both on the technology side, as well as the policy framework side, as, as some of the other panelists have sort of alluded to. Overall, kind of a, a mix of excitement, but also a little bit of nervousness or uncertainty around AI. Uh, again, like you know, like you see in many large Fortune 500 companies, uh, I think people are, are realizing that AI is is not this magical power, but a, a practical capability. And just like anything, mastering it requires an appreciation for its limits, uh, its essential ingredients, like large amounts of high quality labeled training data. And again, the policy frameworks needed to be successful, like auditability and explainability and, and interpretability and trustworthiness, like uh, like others have mentioned. Definitely makes sense. And um, Nick, I'd be interested to get your perspective on this as well. Thanks. Uh, yeah, and I, I really want to build on what Charlie just said because he he brought up a really key point, which is which is trustworthiness, right? And so I think if we're going to talk about AI strategy in the government, which is you know the the focus of this panel, I think you really have to go back to the development of and then the signature of Executive Order One Three Nine Six Zero, which is put out nine principles for the use of AI in government. And if you look at that as a framework, what you really see there is the government's uh, focus on trustworthiness, and so that that means governance processes, auditability processes, um, documenting engineering processes, labeling data, all of these things, right? So, so sometimes when we're talking about the sentiment of, of, of AI and government, you're absolutely right that there is a, an excitement around it. But at the same time, I think there's, there's a bit of a caution because people that are in policy positions understand that if we don't get data right, we don't get AI right. And if we don't get you know, governance processes, right? If we miss on public trust, then we miss across the board. And especially talking for in DHS, where we have such a broad, uh, you know, mission set that covers immigration and, and uh, you know, critical infrastructure and all these different areas, the public trust piece is, is central. And if you, if you look at the, the executive order, you look at the DHS AI strategy, and then you look at some of the work that uh, is being is coming out of the um, AI.gov, the National AI Council that uh, Lynn Parker chairs. 
you'll see that that's, that is what we're really talking about here is public trust, democratization of AI, um, and, and putting those structures in place as a foundation so that we can move forward with uh, use case implementation. Wow, thank you. That's, a, that's definitely an important perspective to consider. Uh, Jerry or Bill, anyone else wanna join in there? I guess I'm uh, happy to um, chime in. I think uh, Nick, Charlie, and uh, Thorsen all made really great points, um, especially regarding uh, you know some of the regulatory considerations and policy considerations around AI. I, I'd summarize uh, going back to the original question: What is the sentiment around AI and government today? Um, you know, if I had to summarize it in two words, it would be cautious optimism. Because I think everyone in the room and everyone involved in sort of the AI and government space is in awe at all of the amazing things that AI can do as a technology, but we're also uh, you know, well aware that AI right now is um, the popular conception and the reality on the ground is sort of as a black box technology where the explainability side of AI has lagged behind the raw technical capability um, component of AI. So, uh, you know, I think your original question highlighted an interesting duality in uh, government technology, which is this simultaneous perception that government has been both responsible for many of the most innovative technologies that power our world and perhaps slower than industry to actually deploy that technology in our own workflows and processes. I think a, a sort of first stab in an explanation here is that when innovation requires a large upfront investment in basic research infrastructure and sort of domain understanding to enable technology, government will often be leading the way. This was the case with uh, the internet. This was the case with GPS, other fundamental at the time emerging technologies that required a huge initial outlay in uh, investment. Now, when in innovation entails the exploration of a large space of ideas that can benefit from an already known technology and what I'll call sort of like applied R&D mode, that tends to be what industry is best at. So we're in this interesting mix in government where we, we have this thing AI and we've seen all the cool things it can do. And it's unclear whether we should treat AI as that first category of technologies or the second, right? Whether AI is this still sort of nascent uh, sort of technology that requires a huge amount of investment and sort of a national scale basic research um, thrust to advance, or whether it's uh, something that's ready for the applied R&D mode where um, industry might be uh, great partners to government to help government enable um, a lot of uh, use cases of perhaps more, um, more mature instantiations of AI. So I think we're in this um, void, at least for now, where uh, you know, it's not super clear which mode we should be tackling. So in a lot of agencies, we've simply been approaching it in both modes, both as a basic technology to be better understood, better explored um, and regulated, and something that we uh, you know, today want to leverage to enable business use cases for our, our staff and our customers. And it'll be interesting over the next few years to see which one um, you know, takes more precedence from a government-wide perspective. Definitely. And Bill, what about you? Are you cautiously optimistic as well? I am, but um, I'm very excited about how the government is moving forward with uh, taking a look and embracing emerging technologies. And you can see that with the process that the government's putting in place around um, uh, you know, different innovation centers, emerging technology centers, uh, the OTA process within the Department of Defense in embracing new, more competitive technologies over the old legacy uh, solutions that were available. And this is extremely important for our government to embrace these new technologies. It's not Skynet at this point. And so, but going back to the whole idea of ethics within AIML is critical and being able to uh, maintain the integrity of uh, the, the use cases, the models um, as you move forward with deploying artificial intelligence within the government. But I do see that um, 
that they are more open uh, to embrace um, emerging technologies now than they have been in the past. Great points. And I think, you know, uh, I think that leads us kind of into our next question, uh, which is where are the single biggest areas for AI impact across the government? Um, and I think I'll toss this one to Nick to start us off. Sure, thanks. Um, so, you know, as, as far as impact, I think, I think there's, you have, to, uh, you have we have to kind of define what we mean by impact, right? So were we talking about impact that the system is going to have on a government mission? Or are we talking about you know, what, what is government's contribution? What is their most significant contribution to AI? And so I think, I think if, to kind of look at both of those things, I think on the contribution side, I think, you know, government is, is pushing very hard to, um, to do things like, uh, like drive innovation and, and push, um, push the limits of AI and, and, and get its requirements out, to, mission requirements out to the innovators um, to, to drive those types of solutions, right? So I think that's one big one. I think another one is, uh, is contributions on, on governance and transparency uh, and, and using AI in a way that inspires public trust. So I think that's, those are gonna be big areas for contribution for impact on, on that side. Now on the, on the system side, um, you know, it, there's, there are use cases and then there is what's actually being done now. And if we wanted to have a conversation about use cases, we'd be here for a very long time talking about all the potential applications of AI across the federal government. So, you know, I think just, and this is maybe a little bit of a boring answer, but I think a, a, a good example is, uh, is, is business process automation. It, it can have huge impact to how the government runs, it, it, the efficiency of the government, um, the government workforce, all of these, all of these different aspects. So I think that, while that's not as exciting as, you know, I don't know, uh, UASs or something like that, it, it, is, it is, I think, um, really a, a big area for impact that can really uh, help the government be much more efficient, much more agile, um, and, and be able to uh, adopt these technologies much more quickly. Excellent. Yes, definitely. And Bill, I think you'd have an interesting perspective on this one, too. You know, I, I think that, you know, what I'm seeing right now, there's so many different ways that the government is looking to leverage uh, AI to improve the processes, exactly what Nick was just talking about. And AI is excellent at pattern recognition and can help identify different anomalous activities, uh, could be used for fraud, uh, and it could do it much faster than humans can do it. Uh, it can speed the delivery of all different types of um, applications and interactions with our citizens, right? So, you know, a, a lot of uh, uh, what we're seeing right now is how uh, AI can be used to interact um, with uh, citizens uh, via virtual assistants or chat boxes. Um, they can, it could be uh, used to help citizens fill out forms. Um, there's just so many different uh, applications from within the entire federal government of DOD, uh, the intelligence community, and in the civilian verticals. And that's, that's one aspect of it. Nelly, Torsten, anything to add? Yes, um, so uh, maybe just to build on that, uh, um, from a European perspective, uh, I think Europe is lucky that has AI Watch, uh, which is the European Union's uh, observatory working together with the OECD AI Policy Watch, and has identified a few areas where the government see uh, impact for the administration itself. And uh, leading here is uh, the, the public services and engagement with citizens, uh, followed by internal processes, uh, but also law enforcement. Uh, and maybe as a fourth, uh, fourth area is uh, uh, regulatory research, analysis, and monitoring. I think, I think especially in the e EU, which takes actually a uh, a, a regulatory approach uh, and a risk approach towards AI. Um, so it needs to also deal with all the regulation it produces. Uh, and it has actually produced a, a quite extensive landscape of regulations, uh, including the, the, the newly uh, released AI Act proposal. But on the other hand, I also, we should not uh, lose track on how the industry is moving 
uh, ahead. So it's not just say, oh, which areas could be interesting. At the same time, the technology is uh, probably moving from uh, what we call narrow to broad or broader AI. Uh, it is moving from the initial focus of uh, consumer retail uh, to uh, to more uh, uh, enterprise AI, intelligent enterprises, uh, also tackling global issues uh, like climate change, like health, food, water, uh, water issues. Um, and uh, also the, the idea that uh, data, of course, play a very, uh, very important role uh, and, and data sovereignty becomes also very important here. So the sharing of data and building data alliances, because many parts like uh, it's, if you take Germany, for example, uh, many municipals have not enough data actually to build and run the uh, uh, or, or train uh, train. Uh, algorithms, so they need to team up with other municipals, uh, but they're quite reluctant actually sharing data. So, so that initiative, which has been recently introduced, uh, what's called Gaia X, uh, to build those trusted uh, federated data spaces, uh, could be very helpful uh, also to encourage uh, the public sector um, to uh, to build uh, uh, intelligent services uh, for for their uh, portfolios. Makes perfect sense to me. Charlie, anything to add there? Yeah, sure. I, I tend to think more, you know, specifically around applications and, and different use cases, right? And so, you know, uh, I view AI as being the ultimate force multiplier for analysts and other knowledge workers who have to sift through uh, uh, endless volumes of data, whether they're trying to find that one needle in the haystack or maybe summarizing across all of their data holdings all at once. Uh, at Snorkel, we're helping U.S. national security customers create really game-changing machine learning applications to uh, analyze and connect uh, disparate data sets, apply context and infer meaning, and really help them, you know, ensure and maintain an unfair advantage. Uh, these federal customers are also relying on Snorkel's technology to rapidly label uh, vast amounts of network traffic data to train machine learning models for a number of uh, mission-critical cyber applications. Um, you know, switching gears a little bit, you know, AI and machine learning are also powerful for, you know, powerful tools for accelerating the speed and quality of life-saving work performed by medical professionals, whether you're talking the research lab or all the way to the emergency room. Uh, Snorkel's also helping government agencies to quickly and easily create powerful AI applications to enhance the efficiency and effectiveness of financial operations. So like going to, to, to Nick's point about, you know, business process automation. And so whether it's you know, unlocking new analyses, insights, uh, operational capabilities to smoothly ensuring regulatory compliance, uh, we help these organizations go beyond kind of you know, the really limited off the shelf tools and build their own you know, world-class solutions for their exact needs. So you know, I'd say analytic op applications to include cyber, uh, improving healthcare outcomes, uh, and helping to administrate, administrate, uh, automate administrative workflows like financial management systems are uh, what I would say are the, the top areas for impact that I'm seeing. Great, yeah. Um, Jerry, anything to add on that? Uh, yes, so I wanna go back real quick to uh, Nick's, uh, I think it was Nick's original um, sort of bifurcation of this question into two parts. How will AI impact the government? And then how will government actually impact the course of progress in AI? Now, hitting on that latter pillar, um, right now we are, uh, some observers uh, have commented that we are in a AI race between two disparate visions of AI. One is AI as um, you know, transformative uh, technology that will you know, improve the lives of folks around the world and advance democratic aims. The other is AI as a, you know, as another tool in the toolbox for uh, some of our adversaries to advance their national objectives and to perpetuate their uh, systems of governance and systems of interacting with their citizenry. So there's been a lot greater focus over the past few months and years on making sure that AI development advances democratic norms. And we've seen this uh, with uh, things like the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, who recently hosted a global emerging technology summit involving uh, leaders from uh, democratic countries around the world uh, to uh, basically gather everyone into one room and you know, first acknowledge that we are in this AI race 
between two competing uh, sort of visions of how AI should advance in the world and to brainstorm on uh, sort of how we can make sure that the uh, sort of vision of democratic societies can be upheld in developing and advancing AI. So, uh, you know, that's, I, I think over the decade horizon, that's going to be how government will seek to advance AI. The jury's gonna be out on whether we're successful on that, but it's really a sort of whole of government initiative to make sure that what we're doing um, in America and our allies is um, promoting that vision. The sort of AI impacting government, I very much agree with uh, Bill and I think a couple other uh, folks who've uh, mentioned that AI is really going to start being used a lot more for service delivery. So service delivery can entail delivering services to our customers in the form of chatbots and virtual assistants and other uh, sort of quote unquote help me tools. Uh, the other big domain of service provision is service provision to our staff and employees, right? Our employees, particularly at the USPTO, are subject matter experts, right? Their, their subject matter expertise is going to depend on which agency they're in, but they've been highly trained. Uh, they demonstrate high amounts of interest in the domains that their agencies work in, right? You probably wouldn't join the USPTO, for example, unless you had a broad best of interest in uh, helping our country advance our world-class intellectual property system. So e you have these domain experts, these subject matter experts in each agency, and you want to make sure that that you know tremendous, awe-inspiring amount of human capital that you've invested in bringing in into your agency has best-in-class tools to enable them to uh, to do their jobs well. So what uh, I think someone used the term force multiplier. That's a, I think that's a perfect descriptor of how a lot of agencies are seeking to use AI. They have great people uh, staffing every role in their agencies. They're thinking about how to make those folks' jobs easier, how to enable them to uh, you know, create better work product, to make sounder decisions, and add, ultimately add more value with each and everything that uh, they do. Now, what you're not going to see a huge amount of impact in, at least in the near to medium term, is AI in a decision-making or adjudication role. That's something that implicates a lot of the trustworthy, uh, trustworthiness concerns that we discussed in the last question. And uh, you know, just if, if you just think about it intuitively, let's say uh, you get into an accident and you find yourself in the position of needing to apply for a social security disability benefits. Um, what is your reaction going to be to an AI quote unquote adjudicator that says, yes, you can have your benefits or no, your benefits are being denied. Even if the answer comes back as yes, you're still going to you know, come away from that experience being like, well, why was it a yes? Sort of, um, did they, what did they even consider in making that decision, right? But if the answer is a no, then think about it. You've essentially been denied a fundamental benefit that you have been conditioned and socialized to rely on by something that, you know, it's, it's literally a set of mathematical vectors being multiplied and added in interesting ways and somehow arriving at the conclusion that, no, you're not actually disabled, right? That's something that we as a democratic society are unprepared to accept. So decision-making in any context, in the intellectual property context and the social security context will for the foreseeable future remain in the province of human trained expert human decision makers. And AI's role in that will simply be to advise and support those human decision makers and make uh, ultimately applying their situational judgment and those very nuanced and often very difficult decisions. Yeah, wow, great perspective there. And you know, we've talked a lot about the potential, but I think that's a perfect segue into uh, some of the challenges. So our next question is, what challenges does the government face when leveraging AI today? And we'd love examples if you can give them. Um, so I'm actually going to toss this one to Charlie to kick us off. Yeah, great. Uh, uh, and, and I think it's it's really some of the things that we've been we've been talking about, you know, throughout this this panel, right? And, and to me, it's really two things. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, training data and trustworthiness, right? And so on the, the training data side, 
to do almost anything in machine learning, you need lots of high quality label training data for your specific task, your specific application, your specific data and use case. The traditional way of, of creating that labeled training data is to throw people at the problem. Uh, um, you know, if you are Google or Facebook, you know, you've got a, a billion users you can mobilize to perform that labor for you for free. Every time you log in with Gmail now, it's click on the trucks in this picture, whatever they're doing that day, right? But most organizations don't have that sort of free labor at their, at their fingertips. Well, there's lots of, you know, crowdsourcing, outsourcing firms out there where you can pay random strangers on the internet to label your data for you, right? That's great unless you've got private sensitive or classified data and then it's a complete non-starter. But if you try to do this internally, most organizations don't have hundreds or thousands of people that can sit around and, and spend all day labeling data for weeks or months on end uh, because they have real jobs, otherwise they wouldn't be there, right? The, the subject matter experts that Jerry was talking about. Uh, but there really isn't you know, any other you know, practical way of, of creating this label training data. Uh, and that's really the, the, the main problem that Snorkel solves is we've developed this, these techniques of weak supervision and programmatic labeling where a very small team of non-technical subject matter experts based on their own sort of domain knowledge and expertise can create labeling functions to programmatically label massive amounts of training data in literally a matter of hours, uh, uh, yielding uh, machine learning models that uh, uh, are as good or better in terms of accuracy and other performance metrics and they can adapt uh, uh, on the fly as external data changes or internal mission objectives change uh, uh, really to accelerate that entire process because you know, most of the time that's spent on building machine learning applications isn't on the modeling part, it's on the, the, the training data side. And then with you know, trustworthiness and explainability, you know, that's, that's a big thing that we run into all the time with our customers. You know, we work with a lot of highly regulated industries, banks, insurance companies, and the federal government who are under increasing requirements to you know, provide justifications and explanations and, and auditability and transparency around the processes uh, that, that they're running. So imagine uh, uh, you know, someone applying for a credit card or a mortgage and gets you know, denied. Many jurisdictions now say that that individual has the right to request an explanation or justification. And if that system is sort of you know, based on a black box neural network trained on 2 million hand labeled examples with absolutely no rationale being tracked or anything, there's no way that you're gonna pull out uh, a, a realistic explanation from, from that, especially something a lay person is going to understand. You know, same thing in, in government, right? Uh, uh, decision support systems, you know, some course of action being recommended, you know, that, that leader decision maker, you know, wants to be able to basically interrogate that system and say, you know, how did you arrive at this conclusion? Why should I trust you? And, and rightly so. With our approach of programmatic labeling, it actually becomes trivial to take that model output trace it back to those labeling functions that are human written, human readable, attributable to specific individuals if you want them to be for, explain, or for uh, accountability purposes, and then use that to form the basis of an explanation you know, to that consumer or to that decision maker that says, hey, here's how this system was designed by, by our in-house domain experts. Here are the specific criteria uh, uh, that they designated as being the key factors here. Here are the ones that applied to this specific situation. If these factors were different, the outcome could have been different. Uh, and, and use that to, to explain to that, you know, lay person, you know, how the system uh, uh, performs. And at the same time, it's, it's, you know, robust to reverse engineering, because even if you had all of the labeling functions, uh, uh, you wouldn't be able to recreate the model unless you had all of the internal data associated with it too. Uh, uh, so we help, we think that this is a, a really sort of unique way to kind of cut through this problem and, and solve it in a way that's both uh, um, satisfying to the technologists involved that are driving these systems and the consumers and, and uh, decision makers involved at the other end. Great, thank you for sharing that, Charlie. Um, and Jerry, um, do you have anything to add? I know you were also talking about a lot of the challenges. Yes, I think, um, you know, we've already talked about uh, issues of trustworthiness at length and there are a lot of really smart people thinking through those, uh, thinking through those challenges. I think just at the ground level of developing and integrating AI, the most preeminent challenge we're gonna face is marrying subject matter expertise with the technology and involving the um, former into the development of the latter, right? So um, I think data labeling, uh, as Charlie mentioned, is one end of it, but I'd encourage um, us to actually take a more uh, higher level look at it, which is in every stage of the AI development process from developing data sets to figuring out how that data is actually going to inform the model 
to training the model to then using the model's outputs to then maybe even building some sort of feedback loop from the outputs back to the inputs, uh, sort of shaping the data or uh, augmenting the data so that um, you know, learnings from the outputs can then be fed back in to make you know, a better input data set and better model. Each step in that process I just described is something that not only can benefit from subject matter experts, it, arguably it requires subject matter expertise to be able to do well, right? You, you, have, a, you have the world's best uh, language model. Let's say you have a GPT, uh, you know, GPT-3 is a famous language model these days, right? Let's say you have a uh, GPT-9 that, you know, just has insanely uh, high fidelity of language modeling, extremely, uh, what we call extreme low perplexity, I guess, in technical terms. You have that, what do you do with it? What do you, what do you do with it? You, let's say you train down the data set you want to train, now it spits out all these nice little probability distributions on words. How do you integrate that into your actual business processes? That's another thing where without the subject matter experts in the room and ultimately driving you toward making those decisions, you can have the world's best technology. You can invest millions upon millions of dollars in data and infrastructure, uh, everything under the sun, you're gonna get nowhere. So really, I think the biggest challenge across agencies, we definitely feel this at the USPTO and uh, you know, at the USPTO, our AI development teams involve, uh, I'll say a comparable number of technologists and subject matter experts in the room working together, driving at these uh, decisions. You know, in developing technology for the USPTO, we have patent examiners, we have lawyers in the room, we have uh, policymakers, people from all different backgrounds, right? Uh, other agencies also face similar challenges and they're going to need to figure out how to get the subject matter experts in the room in terms of labeling, as Charlie mentioned, but also in terms of training the model, figuring out what to do with the training model, uh, and then ultimately figuring out how we incorporate their expertise and the review of the AI uh, model's outputs back into the inputs of the next stage of AI training. So, you know, if you do this right, you can get really great uh, perpetual improvement loops in AI. If you don't do it well, then you're going to get AI that, you know, looks fancy, you deploy it in your fancy cloud or fancy on-premise server, and you get nowhere. So that's really what we're looking at in terms of um, how we can uh, develop AI that ultimately solves real problems and the government is facing. Great, thank you, Jerry. And um, Nick, what's your perspective on this? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I mean, great perspective so far, but I mean, my, my answer is gonna be kind of short. So risks or challenges that we're facing, data policies, governance processes, workforce, risk. And so if you look at the DHS AI strategy, we lay out five goals and those goals all are aimed at public trust, but they're aimed at these, these specific areas. And so I'll just use risk as one example. There's risk of adversaries using AI against the homeland, but then there's also risk of us using AI, you know, and those, 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 those take different forms and they mean different things. And, and one of the big challenges here is current cyber models, risk models are inadequate to address it. And so, you know, we're pushing hard for things like, you know, security from the design phase, right? Cybersecurity from the design phase, security, the algorithm, security, the data um, from design. And then, you know, workforce is one that's a challenge kind of for everyone. And so that is something that right now in our implementation activity, so I, I lead the implementation of our AI strategy at the department, what we are really focusing in on getting our governance right, we believe that's foundational, and getting, getting our workforce right also is a foundational a action. And we're, we're working on the other ones as well, but I mean, really looking hard at these things because they are, are inherent challenges that we're gonna have to deal with that if we ever hope to get to the inspiration of public trust, we're gonna have to do these things right. So again, you know, I think it's, it's data policies, governance processes, workforce, and risk kind of in both of those categories. Great, thank you, Nick. Um, it, Bill or Torsten, anything to add before we move on to the next question? Just very quickly, I agree with the comments so far. I mean, everyone sounds like it's spot on. You know, taking a look at uh, legacy and data sets that are, you know, 
all over the place, disparate data sets and bringing this data together and looking at the models and being able to secure those models and run those models uh, efficiently um, and more accurately is you know, another issue that um, I think the government agencies are, are looking at right now. As, as the models change, and, and we heard Jerry mention about the GPT models, right, from a next gen perspective, you know, you've got to be able to have uh, the compute power behind that and the, um, uh, and, the, and the systems and processes to optimize um, accurately uh, the performance and the outcome of those models. And, uh, and that's, that's something that I know that a number of the folks that I've been speaking with in the federal government have expressed some concerns around of being able to um, move into a uh, next gen type of environment where they can run those advanced models uh, along with the data readiness piece and the securing of the models as well. Great perspective. Thanks for adding, Bill. Thorsten, uh, Thorsten, anything to add before we jump to the next question? Yeah, maybe. We, I mean, that's a great conversation. Thank you. Maybe briefly to Nick's uh, um, emphasis on trust, uh, which I uh, fully, uh, fully agree. Uh, and I think the trust element uh, is uh, is ha has a problem in the way that actually the trust is already low. It has nothing to do with AI, but trust in uh, in public administrations, even in businesses, is quite low. Uh, on the other hand, we have a very complex technology coming where you need trust. So we have a double broken uh, situation, and uh, I think the trust plays out maybe in three. Uh, three ways. First, uh, this trustworthiness is actually, a, 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 it sounds like a general uh, approach, but it's actually a very technical approach uh, to have certification, to have the processes right, etc. Uh, but I think uh, the industry, the AI industry has moved on from uh, the trustworthiness, not that it has got it right yet, but uh, uh, there was a, like a tech optimism and it uh, moved into a tech realism. And it's not just about trustworthiness on the problem solving. We are now dealing with dilemmas also, right? Um, so we, we, we have to, uh, we have to uh, uh, deal or optimize dilemmas. This would be the, a, a second problem. And I think uh, Jerry alluded to that, uh, uh, maybe in other examples. Do I give ICUs to him? Do I give these ICUs? And if I could model that with my system before, maybe I don't have that uh, moral decision to make. But then the third level is uh, on an aggregated level, less on a direct threat or risk level, but on an aggregated level. I mean, AI will change uh, the labor market. AI will change uh, security, uh, national security concerns. AI will change international relations, also what Jerry uh, mentioned to do. And uh, I think the, the level of dilemma optimization and the, the, the level of aggregated uh, impact, uh, is, this is where you cannot let a, a moral machine run and make decisions, right? So, because it, uh, it, it, these are often political decisions, they involve legitimacy and they involve also responsibility. And I think we're not there yet to give legitimacy and responsibility to an AI system. I think this may be to add to the, uh, the trust trustworthiness uh, debate uh, on, on AI. Wow, thank you. So uh, I'm gonna jump to the next question, just being mindful of time. Uh, we'll give some quick answers for this one. Uh, how do you view government's role as it relates to private sector AI development? Uh, so Bill, why don't you kick us off on this one? So I think you know the government has an incredibly significant role in this um, because they are going to, um, you know, set the standards and the platform for AI that's going to impact all uh, areas of um, uh, government and commercial companies. Um, I think there's a number of uh, different areas that uh, uh, that the government can impact with regards uh, to developing uh, innovative approaches uh, to human machine teaming um, that will use AI to augment human judgment. Great, thank you. Anyone else wanna jump in on that one? Nick, maybe? Uh, sure, so I mean, I, I think that, um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunity for government to, to, you know, to have a good role there, but I think it's in, it's in the areas like 
um, like security by design where, you know, the government has, has the ability to kind of really weigh in and, and say like, communicate its requirements, communicate its mission needs and, and, you know, drive innovation, but do so in a way that is going to protect, um, you know, whether it's, you know, protect intellectual property or it's, it's, you know, protect the security and the integrity of the system. So I think that, you know, in, in those areas, I think the government has a great role to play um, with, with pushing those things out toward the innovators. Um, but at the same time, you know, being that consumer and, and being that, um, you know, that driver of innovation. Excellent points. Anyone else have anything they want to add before we jump into our final question for the day? All right. So let's jump into our last question. Let's talk big picture. How do you see the future of AI within the government in five to 10 years? So we're going to do this in kind of a rapid fire format. So Jerry, let's kick it off. What do you think? Perfect. So I, I guess early, if you think about uh, the history of AI and government, early efforts have really sprung up in a uh, largely ad hoc manner. You know, at the USPTO, our very first open data and AI initiatives were, were with sort of scrappy three to five person teams, you know, working out of spare rooms uh, somewhere in the headquarters building. And across the government, you see these other AI efforts spring up on almost a weekly, monthly basis with goals, organizational structures, resourcing tailored toward um, you know, their immediate problem domains. I think in, over the next decade, we're going to see a lot more systemization of AI work in the government, technical standards for how to um, operate, deploy, and quantitatively evaluate AI, trustworthiness um, and transparency standards that we've already discussed at length today. And ultimately, I think there's also going to be standardization of some core technologies across agencies. So I want to be careful here. Each agency is solving different problems, has a different set of uh, constituents, but I wouldn't be surprised if certain core components of AI that are common across different use cases were informally standardized in a decade's time frame. This could be on the hardware side. This could be on the modeling side. For example, perhaps there will be a language model trained across the Federal Register, which is sort of the government's regulatory newspaper of sorts, right? And this can be used for regulatory analysis across all agencies, right? These sorts of common tools, I think, as agencies start realizing that you now the guy next door is doing the same thing as us, they're really going to come together and figure out what common tools can be reused, can be shared across the government. And it's going to evolve into a lot more systemic approach to AI across our various government agencies. Thanks, Jerry. Very exciting. Charlie, what do you think? Yeah, so for me personally, I'm hoping that, that AI becomes as boring and commonplace as the internet is today, right? So I remember, uh, uh, you know, like 25 years ago, back when the web was this exciting and maybe somewhat scary new technology and everyone's scrambling to figure out their internet strategy and how they're going to become a web-enabled organization. And today, you know, the internet is so deeply ingrained into virtually everything that we do that we don't even notice it anymore. It's just this boring thing that we basically all take for granted. You know, like when's the last time you walked into a bank to conduct business or make a transaction, right? You pull out your phone or, or whatever. Uh, so I'm looking to, forward to, you know, when AI and machine learning, uh, uh, you're sort of, you know, just, just a thing that's there like the web, right? Uh, in order to get there, we've, we've got to make building these AI applications something that's practical for virtually every organization, uh, just like how, you know, today everyone's got a website and conducts a huge portion of their business online. Uh, and that's what we focus on at Snorkel, making it practical for any enterprise to build AI applications for their unique needs and use cases. Great. Thanks, Charlie. Torsten, what do you think? So uh, for me, it's not half full, half empty. I think I'm pretty realist, but there's some voices which say in the last five to 10 years, we will have 50, 60% of the jobs we don't know. Why shouldn't this apply to the public services? Uh, maybe maybe less so because usually it moves a little bit slower, but uh, I think this we should need to consider that there's huge transformation uh, and automation. And it is not just we have to wait for uh, more advanced AI or even uh, 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 
uh, or even uh, general intelligence, I think already narrow eye is very powerful. Uh, on a positive note, I think we uh, we are moving from uh, more uh, transaction based to more mobilization and learning platforms. And uh, maybe as a very positive scenario that we have a kind of interaction, uh, uh, what Jerry actually alluded to, uh, between the citizen, uh, the servant, and the algorithm, uh, helping to sort out and to have a have a, a, a seamless uh, public service and action uh, and on a final note I, I hope that uh, that the, uh, the the governments can use the technology also to really tackle the big issues uh, like climate change and other and other uh, other points thank you excellent point thanks Thorsten uh, Bill what are your thoughts so I I do uh, appreciate everyone's perspective on this um, I think that you know, what I am most excited about in seeing uh, with the future of AI ML is it becoming more uh, commonplace. Um, it, exactly what Charlie was me mentioning around, uh, you know, as common as, as the internet is uh, today. But I think there's some things that will happen and that will be uh, around building that common digital infrastructure uh, to support AI. I think developing a, a digitally uh, literate workforce. Uh, again, having those subject matter experts and then instituting, uh, you know, a just a, a more agile acquisition budget and oversight process around uh, AI with, um, again, building trust uh, with the community around the integrity of that overall system is going to be uh, critical. Definitely. Thanks, Bill. And Nick, last but not least. Thanks. Uh, in five to 10 years, uh, I see the government as having uh, longstanding and robust relationships with private sector and academia, uh, having an educated workforce that is running efficient processes um, across the government, um, leading internationally with our partner countries uh, in, in the standards and norms for AI use and development, and doing all of it in a way that inspires public trust. Wow, a lot of great perspectives today and great insights. And I know this virtual audience has a lot to take home to think about. So thank you all so much for sharing your perspectives with us today. And a huge virtual round of applause for me and all of the audience listening in. We really appreciate you taking time to share your perspective. For the audience, it's time for you to make your way to your next session. Along the way, make sure you accept your connection request and take some time to check out our amazing exhibits. Thanks so much. And thank you again to our panelists and we'll see you around. Have a great one.